So um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this year's first installment of the Boost Your Skills webinar series, where we enlist the advice of specialist experts in order to help you make the most out of your university experience and to acquire the skills to help you succeed and develop on both a professional and personal level. My name is Siddharth and joining me is Jenny and we are your Boost Your Skills team. This event is in webinar format, so you will not be able to turn on your cameras and mics, but we would still love to hear from you through the chat function. This is a safe space with no judgments being passed, so please feel free to ask questions without any fear or worry. If you are still anxious, feel free to message us anonymously and we will pass it on. The event will consist of a presentation followed by some time at the end for Q&A. The event is also being live streamed to our YouTube channel, so don't worry if you've missed something. We'll be sharing a link to the video and slides after the event. And a big, big thank you to all our attendees who pre-submitted questions. We host live webinars regularly, and if you'd like to stay updated, follow our Instagram page at Boost Your Skills and keep an eye on the events tab on your engagement portal. I will now hand over to Amber from Sage Publishing. Um, thanks so much for joining us today. My name's Amber and I'm a marketing executive for nursing at Sage Publishing. I'm so excited to introduce you to our author for this webinar, Bob Price. Bob is a healthcare education and training consultant who was formerly a director of postgraduate awards in advancing healthcare practice at the Open University. A passionate educator, Bob has assisted students at every level from pre-registration programs of study up to and including Doctor of Philosophy. Bob's doctoral thesis was on the negotiation of learning and strategies used by students and tutors to develop scholarly and professional forms of expression. We're lucky to have been able to work with Bob on his book, Delivering Person-Centred Care in Nursing and Critical Thinking and Writing in Nursing. Could I have the next slide, please? For today's webinar, we'll share practical guidance on what it means to think critically as a nurse and how to apply this to study and practice. It will also provide a unique framework for developing essential critical skills. Critical thinking and writing are central to effective nursing practice, so this event is perfect for any budding nurses. This webinar will bring together practical and effective tips from Bob's book, in particular, Critical Thinking and Writing in Nursing, for which a new edition will be publishing on February 24th. To learn more about these books and to get an exclusive 15% off your copies, you can scan the QR code on your screen or follow the link on the slide. Both paperback and ebook versions are available, and you can pre order the newest edition on the John Smith website now with this text with more information on practice templates. We encourage everyone to pop their questions in the QA section on Zoom. If you have any further questions after this session's over, or if you're watching this as a recording, we'll pop an email in the chat and the description where you can direct your questions up until the end of January. This webinar is being streamed on YouTube, and you'll be able to watch the recording, which we will circulate shortly after the webinar. Without further ado, I'm delighted to be passing over to Bob. Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and to sense really the presence of quite so many of you out there. Um, I can only begin to guess at what level that you're interested in this subject matter, whether in fact uh, you're on an undergraduate program, perhaps postgraduate, or even higher, or perhaps you've simply got an interest in this from the point of Point of view of professional update. Where do you start from? Critical thinking and reflective practice combined become very, very important in nursing courses. And I wanted to help you to think through that subject matter uh, over the course of the next 45 minutes or so. I hope to talk till about 10 to 3, uh, and at which point we'll move to questions, which Siddharth will field, and I'll do my very best to help you with. Um, before we get into the absolute subject matter, um, I think it's very useful, very briefly, to tell you what led to this collection of books, which is now uh, approaching its sixth edition. And um, it's to try and help reassure you um, that I've been intimately involved in thinking about how we think. I've got a sneaky suspicion, and see if this is true for you, um, that whilst you're on a course at whatever level, in whatever field, I have a sneaky suspicion that a lot of the content of what you're doing is about the subject matter. It's about the context. It's about the ologies and the subject matter that um, uh, has to be covered. Very little on courses, in my experience, actually uh, explain to you and suggest what learning is like and what you're trying to do as you navigate through the course as a whole. 
it can be very, very daunting to do that. So let me tell you very briefly um, four little backgrounds that led to me writing critical thinking and writing uh, in nursing. Um, some are more recent than others, but let me start with a very early one. Long time ago, uh, when mammoths still roamed the earth, um, I was involved in um, burns and plastic work. I was involved in trauma and casualty work. And I worked in a military hospital, the Queen Elizabeth Military Hospital in London. And I, back in the 1990s, I was involved in uh, what was called ultra body image care. And one of the problems we had at that stage was trying to find ways to explain what we were trying to do with people who had been badly burnt. Some of you may know Simon Weston, a very famous Welsh guardsman who has been a, uh, an advocate of rehabilitation and recovery. Uh, well, I was involved in Simon's care and many like him during the Falklands conflict and beyond. Later, I moved to the Royal Marsden Hospital. Uh, where I dealt with a lot of people who were disfigured due to cancers or the treatments which were necessary. What became apparent in altered body image care was that we didn't have a theory to explain what we were trying to do. We knew that people became disfigured, but we didn't know what the nurse was meant to do about that. So one of the first things that I did, and I wrote a book about it at the time, was how uh, to help people to conceptualise what altered body image was and what they were trying to do. So that was an example of practice, miserable, difficult, daunting practice in some regards, trying to work out what sort of theory we needed to give shape to what we are trying to do. So that was one of the origins of this book, way, way back in 1990. I think another origin of this book, um, and leading directly to this presentation, was the NMC standards for practice. I wonder how many of them you know exist, how many um, standards there are in the whole list under the five different fields. There are, in fact, I think 106 um, care standards, which uh, the registered nurse is meant to adhere to. And if you pause to think about that, it's going to be a bit daunting, isn't it? Because you think to yourself, how in goodness am I meant to accommodate all of those and make them all work together? So critical thinking sometimes is about working out how a theory or a standard or a policy or a protocol can become a practice. And most of your registered nursing lives will be spent engaged in that sort of work. The third um, content um, background to the, for the books um, started really with one of the students. If any of you read uh, Critical Thinking and Writing Nurse in a previous edition, you'll realize that I use or work with um, four student case studies. And there was a student in that group that I was privileged to work with called Raymet. Raymet um, had previously come from overseas and college work overseas and had to try and make sense of nursing course in the UK. And we once had a conversation wandering along the beach and she said to me, Bob, there's a problem here. Um, one minute I'm on the land which is like the campus and all the theory is there. And the next minute they chuck me into the sea like a bait on the end of a fishing rod. And I'm meant to make sense of practice. Then they wind me in again and try to bring me back to campus and somehow tell me what practice uh, is meant to explain to me. And the problem is I'm being cast out and wound back in again without much notion of how the two bits come together. Now, so my second sneaky suspicion is, I bet you've been there. I bet you've actually had that experience yourself. So we're going to be trying to tackle some of that in the book and, of course, in this presentation. The last um, context for this uh, is actually to do with educational work. I was, as you've heard from the introduction, I was previously director of postgraduate courses at the Open University in Healthcare. And at that stage, when I was working there, uh, courses were moving to become much more technology based, much more like this webinar and podcasts and seminars online. But it was a big shift from what the Open University had been doing at that point, which was to deliver lots of education in boxes. You got a box with a lot of textbooks and a lot of study guides and a lot of practical case studies. And you were taught your course. When we moved, in the uh, middle 90, late 1990s, early 2000s, towards a more technology-based learning, suddenly it was very different for students. Suddenly it felt like uh, a go off and find out exercise, much more library-based, and you were meant to learn with each other. 
my third sneaky suspicion then is that you've had that experience as well. And if you were a social learner, if you enjoyed learning with and from others, then it was a delight. But if you were a private learner, and many distance learning students are, then it might have seemed just a little bit terrifying. So those were the contexts that led to the writing of critical thinking and writing in nursing and to the sixth edition, which will be shortly out. And I think it's probably the best iteration of what I've concluded from all of those sort of background experiences, which I'll allude to briefly as we go along. Next slide, please. I think that this is probably, my guess, it's probably what you might be experiencing now. The first thing to say is that learning to nurse is complex, isn't it? If you just pause to think how many different subject matter you have to cover on your course, how many different modules you travel through, how many placements you might go on, how many models of healthcare, how many bits of research you have to contemplate. It's a very, very complex subject. It's not like learning an abstract subject where you can simply get a hold of it and say, history is like this, the French language is like that. This is an applied subject and you have to go backwards and forth between many different subjects and settings. And the key problem then is rather like this painting, uh, which I did of the we elven folk, it's tangled and it becomes very complicated to work out what you're meant to be doing. And I think because we're in a situation where courses are modularized, you go through a series of modules each with their assessments, well, that tends to fragment um, the subject of nursing in general. You tend to get it a bit like an exploding puzzle. And a lot of what can be done is uh, you spend your time trying to work out where the edge pieces are and trying to connect them all together. So multiple subjects, modules, and often abstract material, some of which is not there for you to use in practice immediately, some of it which is there to simply help you appreciate the discipline of nursing, is going to make the subject as you come into it, explore into it, like wandering into a wood where all the roots are tangled up and you've got to try and carry a light through and work out the direction in which you wish to travel. Critical theory, uh, critical um, thinking involves two processes, two prominent processes. As I told you about the experience of working in an altered body image with Simon Weston and other patients long ago, um, you are trying to work sometimes from practice to theory. How on earth do we explain altered body image? Simon once said to me, he said, he said um, my face, it looks like a wax crayon that's been left in an oven. And he was referring to the experience of a radical restructuring and a reshaping of his face because of the bad burns that he'd suffered. And that would be true of many burns patients. So sometimes you have to say, well, how do we explain this and help a patient in that circumstance to make sense of their experience and to create some sort of theory, some sort of explanation which we can practically use to help them? So sometimes we're going from practice to theory. But we're also going from theory to practice. And one of the things that I think sometimes happens is that students get lots of theory. They get lots of relatively abstract theory. And it can be the case that it's so um, grandiose, so high level, so complex. You're trying to have the, the feeling, well, I want to ask the lecture, OK, but how does that fit in at the bedside? How does that actually work when I meet patients? So that's that's deduction and practice theory is induction. And you're going backwards and forth between those. I think the other thing, although not many lecturers confide in this to uh, students, is that you're learning the should, the could, and find in the utilitarian. If you imagined a target with must, should in the middle, what you absolutely have to deliver as part of nursing care, you then get a surrounding set of concentric circles around that, which become could and might, might even be nice to know, but not absolutely or, or preferentially useful to know. So you're trying to make sense of that, aren't you? You're trying to think, I've got lots of information. I've either found out in the library or through seminars or the lectures, different lectures from different disciplines have given me. And I've got to try and make sense of how I bring those all together and prioritize what's going to be important for what I have to do to survive the course 
to thrive on the course, become a successful registered nurse or an advanced practitioner or a doctor of science or whatever the level of the course is that you're engaged in. I think the last thing to acknowledge, and we're slowly getting better at this, is that a nursing course involves learning to cope with stress. You are going to have, and perhaps already have had, um, relatively tough times where some bits of learning were harder than others. And if we're going to survive that, if we're going to thrive in that and become confident registered practitioner to meet those 106 or so care standards required by the NMC, well, we're going to have to learn how to cope with stress. And so what I'm trying to do in this book, Critical Thinking and Nursing, uh, sixth edition, is to help you with that, to find some sort of common core, some sort of connecting material that helps you sense where you're going. And it's to that we're going to move forward next. Next slide, please. Critical Thinking and Reflecting, what are they? Um, the book has a whole first section just simply helping you to sort out the terms. But here, because I want to move on to something more practical fairly quickly, I want to just go through them. Thinking is more than information accumulation. There's lots of times where we think information is learning and it's not. If you, for example, think of patient education, helping a diabetic patient to con control their blood sugar levels, giving them information about blood sugar levels is not going to teach them anything. It's not going to help them to think and to become more competent in the control of their medication. So we can start erroneously um, thinking that the more you know, the better you think. The better you think is to do with simple volume of information. And I think that's erroneous. And you, um, you, you may have discovered this already. Thinking involves weighing information, making and evaluating arguments. Now, when I used to talk with Raymet about this, one of the things she used to say to me was, Bob, goodness, there's a bit of a change here between what's required on this course and what I remember from my pre-nursing courses in another college overseas. And she said there, one of the things I learned and it was impressed upon quite strongly was you had to respect and acknowledge the expertise of the lecturer. And therefore, good learning was your ability to recollect and summarize all the things the lecturer was saying. In courses in nursing in the UK, and ever more so, the higher up you go through the um, levels of learning up to PhD level, you're required to do something much more critical than that. You're required to make and evaluate arguments. And my guess is that sometimes making an argument is pretty scary. An argument isn't as com complex as some people think. You say what you think, and then you add in your sentence, because, and then you put the supporting evidence behind that. We do that all the time. I think Shrewsbury Town, my football team, are going to have a tough time in the league this year because they've changed their personnel so much. So that's an argument. It's a simple argument and one that I suffer with for the whole of the football season. Thinking involves Im imagining and speculating and taking risks with ideas. Now, I'll give you another example from the quarters that you might be on already. And that is that you might find that you think and perhaps sometimes it's true, lecturers expect you not to speculate very much at all. It's a experience you can suddenly find that what they really want you to do is to um, recollect and present and collate evidence from elsewhere. When I write articles for the press, this is one of the things I sometimes have a discussion with editors on, because they'll have wished to see that the article or your essay in this case is rich with references. And we want that, of course. We want you to be able to collate and make sense of the literature to date. But if you never imagined, if you never speculated, if you never dared to think outside the box, there isn't much that's going to happen other than a repetition of what went before. We can become paralyzed with the reference everything never speculate. And so within essays and within many pieces of work or uh, discussion work that you do in groups, we hope, I hope that you'll be encouraged carefully and with consideration to others to speculate and to take some risks with ideas. Thinking involves a marriage of evidence and insight and understanding of narratives. 
I'm very keen on narratives. And what do I mean by a narrative? Well, a narrative is the way in which somebody tells a story about their experiences. If you look at the person-centered nurse and care book that I've written, I use case studies where there's a big emphasis upon patients telling their story and how they experience things. If one thing separates us as nurses and midwives and similar uh, qualifications from, say, medicine or more technical fields, it is that we work with the narratives of patients. We live with the experience that they have of what treatment means, what having cancer means, what being disfigured means. And if we don't work with the narrative, then we haven't got much chance of individualizing care. The last point I'd make about critical thinking and reflecting, and you may or may not be a fan of this, is that thinking needs to be collaborative as well as private. Many distance learners, that was with the field in which I worked for a long period of time, are quite private learners. They like to be learning in private and contemplating the information before them. But nursing is a subject which requires rather more collaboration than that. So you may find, and may have found already, that your course involves a lot more learning that sends you off to do group work, to do seminars, to go and do workshops and role play. Yes, I said role play then, didn't I? And so it's a subject area where you do collaborative learning and give permission for other people to teach you, those who are not the lecturer, those who are not the professor, those who are not the expert. And that's what nursing is, because that's how we learn in practice. We have case conferences, we have ward rounds, we have discussions of problem solving or complaint management, and we learn collaboratively. So that's the that's really why um, it, became, it can be really rather difficult to, to learn nursing, uh, much more so than some other areas. Next slide. So what I want to tempt you to think about and it's something which is apparent in the fifth edition of Critical Thinking Writer Nursing, is I want to tempt you to think about something I call practice templates. It's even more prominent in the sixth edition. And what I want to persuade you, and it's quite radical in some ways, is that we have to find information and ways of thinking and approach in particularly patient care we can take from patient to patient to patient encounter to encounter to encounter for the very practical reason it is absolutely impossible to individualize care for every patient in every circumstance i say that because whilst in person centered um uh, delivering person centered care in nursing the original theory was very much idealistic and about making everything individual. I suspect you've already encountered the experience. There's not enough resource to do that. There's not enough time. There's not enough patients who want to negotiate quite that much. What the public often require of nurses is that we come with a certain sense of what's likely to be needed from the outset. They want to think that we've got a sense of what it feels like to be in chronic pain, to deal with a disability, to deal with the stigma that goes uh, with some people's attitudes towards a learning difficulty. So we need to find out those little um, combinations of information, ways of approaching and thinking and explaining and talking, which give us the opening entry to care. And if your course is about anything, it's actually about discovering those practical combinations of information and technique, which enable you to come and meet patients and actually start on the front foot rather than wondering what on earth can I do to help them? That's what a practice template is. It's something which enables us to order, sustain and untangle the information so across all the modules you are studying, all the ologies that you encounter, my suspicion is, is that there will be snippets of information, as there will be in practice placements too, snippets of information which seem to come together and be worthy of noting down in your portfolio, or your course handbook, or within your notes, however you arrange your studies, to enable you to feel there's a direction in my course now. This is what I need to do. When I become a registered nurse or when I become an advanced practitioner or when I become um, the uh, 
professor of this, that, or the other. This is what people are going to need. This is what I can do to help. And this is where I'll start from. I may change that. The template may change. It may be augmented or improved. But you have to have that to start with. And I think that on courses, there should be greater emphasis on learning and upon the search for practice templates going across modules. And that's what this book tries to help you to discover. We need to combine evidence with insight. We need to take theory into practice and use practice to theorize. And we need that sense of direction over the course of study modules. Otherwise, you move from module to module and you could feel that you've simply been cut up into pieces. And I don't think that's actually what you do as a registered nurse or an advanced practitioner. You have something that forms a whole. Some people call that common sense. It's not common sense. It's actually a very professional way of thinking. You might call it nous. Well, I like the word nous. Nous is a northern term for a sense of knowing what works and what fits. Well, I think you develop nous by working on some practice templates. So let's move on from that. Next slide. So a practice template is a predisposition to reason in a particular way. They're developed by nurses to interpret information quickly and smoothly. Don't you just hate nurses who can do that? Don't you just wonder how on earth they manage it? When assisting patients, we learn templates from combining theory and reflection together, identifying that which, of course, is ethical, has utility. And that's a big word. Can it be done? Does it work? And seems a priority those negotiating care. Practice templates is where we start from when offering assistance to patients. And that is the newest, most powerful message, as well as all the practical things about how to write an essay, how to um, pass assessments, how to look scholarly on paper. All that's still within the book and very important. But the new added ingredient, something you can work on with your personal tutor and with the module tutors you meet, is this search for practice templates. Because when you get them, and you'll have them for a number of things over time, you will feel much better about becoming a registered nurse, moving up to the next level, getting the new qualification, taking the responsibility on. Next slide. What are these practice templates? Where we might we find them? Well, here's some. This is me, by the way. I really do look that uh, ugly, but uh, we'll stick with it. Here are some practice templates that, in my experience of working with students and tutors, um, recur again and again and again. They'll happen no matter which placement you're in. They'll happen no matter what field of nursing you're in. So managing pain, counter and distress. Notice how I put the two together. Pain isn't just a physical sensation, it's an emotional uh, encounter, countering distress. So the two for most patients I've ever met in the whole of my life, those I help with when I worked at the Martin doing body image care, those I help with in burns units after the Falklands War conflict, they had a combination of pain and distress, and you have to tackle the two together. So one of the templates you probably usefully working towards is to find exactly that combination and what it takes to manage pain and more importantly to help the patient manage pain because of course in the longer term very often it's not us who's doing the um, agency work it's the patient themselves it's patient agency rather than nursing care agency i think increasingly because of our aging population and uh the fact we have many more chronic diseases there's a lot of work which we're involved in in facilitating rehabilitation. I did a case study in the Person Centre Care book uh, upon uh, an older man who was recovering from COVID and he'd been on intensive care and he'd had some uh, delusional thoughts associated with oxygen depletion and uh, uh, a very disordered experience, very frightening experience uh, of, that he had been abused actually whilst in intensive care. So not only did we have to think in that case study about helping him to reevaluate that and just check that it wasn't true or, or was true, you know, we have to do the business there properly, but we had to think, how do we help him to mobilize in a way that he can do and which his wife can feel confident and confident about as well. So facilitating rehabilitation is a pretty recurring example practice template. Teaching patients is another one. We think of all the conditions where patients have to take control. Affording reassurance. Many patients we first meet need some sort of reassurance and managing risks. Uh, if you think about somebody who's um, developing 
greater levels of dementia as they age, then risk is a constantly dynamic change in a set of circumstances, and we have to help them manage that risk. How much do we want them to be independent, an ethos of nursing, and how much do we want to help them prevent the risks which could cause deleterious uh, additional injury? Ladies and families, simply because we can't deliver all the care ourselves. No health service, NHS or otherwise, can actually deliver everything for every um, consumer that they want. So we have to liaise with other caregivers and listen in effectively. So these are example practice templates. Now, when you look at them, they're not an ology, are they? They are, in fact, things which are quite closely aligned to patient narratives, and they're closely aligned to um, symptoms and signs and dealing with experiences. And I take you back to that point that probably what a nursing course is delivering is helping you to deal with people. It's helping to do with experience. It's helping to do with narratives rather than simply learning an increasing raft of technical information. We need the technical information. It's a tool. But what makes it different and enables us to connect practice with theory, campus with clinical areas, is the way in which we connect those two together. So those become practice templates. Next slide. Practice templates can be extended across modules of study, but they may be field of nursing specific. Some, for instance, in learning disability practice are going to be about advocacy and unique there compared with some other areas of more general nursing. They can help you identify teaching that crosses the theory practice divide. Raymet and her analogy of being slung into the um, sea as a bait on the end of a fishing line and then dragged back in has that uh, had that experience that nothing that she learned in practice seemed to quite tally with what she learned on the campus. And that can be very, very frustrating for students. So looking for the templates in the placement experience, back on the campus and what the lecturers are, are advising you on, you can start to connect them because this is why we need these combinations of information. They form growing records, notes in your portfolio and can be dis discussed with your personal tutor. A lot of students are not quite sure what the personal tutor is for. What am I meant to do with the personal tutor? I, it's going to be, yes, about difficulties with essay writing quite often, but it can be more constructively, more imaginatively, it can be about searching for things. Why not practice templates? They help distinguish the must know from the should know and the nice to know, something I've alluded to earlier. And they can direct your inquiries in practice you will have practice placement objectives or aims. You will have things that your skills that you are meant to practice and tick off, if I can use that phrase. But there's no reason why a practice placement need not be something that you actively explore and get excited about. If you're going to come to the end of your nursing course, again, at whatever level, I think you should be excited. I think you should be um, confident and growing and inquisitive and that's really what we want because if you're going to be a great nurse perhaps for five six decades and some of us are already there in that sort of age group then I think you're going to need something to sustain you and I think if you get the excitement about inquiring and that comes from practice templates then you're going to find that work isn't work you have to doubt whether it's work and whether it's not something that just gives you personal meaning every day you go to work Next slide. I was going to stop at this moment and invite you to think of any recurring areas where uh, your work patients might seem to demand a thought out response. Many of these constitute template reasoning. Now, I think because the number of um, kind folk who are taking time to listen to me garble on, um, we won't pause there. But I would leave that question with you. I'm going to move on fairly quickly because what I want to do, given the number of people registered, I'd like to have more time for questions. And I think some of your questions are going to drill down to very practical things. And that's fine. And I'm delighted to try and help you with those. But don't lose sight of the, the templates, which you might um, already have started to notice. I'm going to move very quickly to give you an example of how that could work and just go use a little case study. So we'll move through the next slides relatively quickly so the next um the first uh, thing that i'm going to say is well what about this pain distress one now you wonder who the woman there is beneath the fishing float 
In fact, I'm from Shropshire, the centre of the universe, as so many of you might already know. And there is in Shropshire a witch that lies beneath the water. And uh, she's called Jenny Greenteeth in Shropshire. She's called different things in other places. But the problem is, is that Jenny Greenteeth comes up and grabs people who go near the water. So mothers used to tell their children, don't go near the water, I was Jenny Greenteeth will get you. Pain and distress is a bit like that. Not only have you to somehow deal with um, the actual experience of what the pain is physically or emotionally, you have to deal with what you think it's going to be like and what it has been like in the past. You're constantly referencing backwards and forth. So that's why we've got the picture, Jenny. Green teeth, fear and trepidation can be a big part of the pain distress case study. Let's see what a template might look like associated with um, pain and distress. Next slide. So some of the things you're taught on campus, and uh, which you may be inquiring about, which could feed into this template are mechanisms, the physiology of pain. There's different typologies of pain, different, different descriptors of pain, um, whether it's grinding, gnawing, whether it's always there, sometimes there, whether it's connected to activities. You'll learn things like pharmacological, non-pharmacological relief measures. They're part of your toolkit. And you'll have concepts such as coping. Different people cope in different ways. Some people, for example, cope with pain by focusing very much on it and uh, attending to it again and again and again. Others try to distract themselves. So concepts of coping are important. And then there's the social psychology of distress and reassurance. Um, Zabrowski, a long, long time ago, decades ago, um, pointed out that people from different cultures actually conceived of and experienced pain in very different ways. Some people would uh, be very ex ex effusive about the pain and describe it in vivid detail. In other cultures, the notion of being effusive and, and complaining, because that's how it was seen, complaining about your pain was seen as negative and shameful. So here's some taught things which might go into that pain distress um, template if you start to write notes. Do you see how you get this material from different courses, different modules, but suddenly it can be woven together and give a purpose to your study in a direction which will help you get through the course even better? Next slide. Let's think about the experience contribution that from clinical practice. Narratives on the origin and meaning of pain. Um, I'll give you one narrative, which isn't directly about pain, but I just want to emphasize to you how individual people can be. When I was doing altered body image work and uh, working as a consultant in different countries to help children and adults to deal with body image um, things and changes to the body, I sometimes work with children. And um, I used to have to try and help them to understand what had happened when they'd had a big operation. Part of their bowel had been removed or their heart had been replaced or something like that. And I used to say to them, I didn't say to them, well, what? how do you think about the inside of your body? I would give them something like a glass of milk. And then I'd say, where's the milk gone? And they'd look up at me as I'm stupid uh, because that's how children do all things very quickly. But And they then said, well, it's down here, Bob. And they point down to their ankles because the conception of their body was like a chocolate bunny rabbit. They were hollow inside. They had no conception of the inside of the bodies. So narratives on the origin and meaning of pain, where the pain is, why it's occurring, how it works to the inside of your body can be very important. And with those children, the notion of altered figuration of the body pain and surgery and all the rest of it, I had to be understood from their point of view. Narratives on right coping. You know, um, dare I say it, I'm going to risk it even though this is recorded. Man flu. Men are meant to experience flu in a different way to women. I'm not going to get caught out on this. But there is a popular folk conception that men tend to um, overblow the flu symptoms and the women are more stoical. Do you see how these are narratives, folk narratives, cultural narratives, social narratives about what is the right way of coping? Do you rush to the doctor or go to retire to the bed, as some people might think a man might do? Or do you soldier on because women are more stoical? So narratives about right coping are important. 
artists and painters stress trade-offs. When is treatment costing too much? Some of the debate about when it's time to um, make an argument to end your life. It could be because, you know, the benefits of treatment, the pain management isn't working, and you have to say there's a trade-off. So there's an artist somewhere around that. An artist on welcome support, level of intrusion, practical recommendations, the nature of solutions. One of the problems of idealised person-centred care is it starts with the premise that everyone wants to negotiate care with you. They don't. They don't want always to get involved. They want you to do something. So what welcome support is, we have to try and discover that and what tends to determine that. So these are things which experience could add into that pain distress template. Next slide, please. So how might we tether all that together? How can we write those notes, which give some sort of direction to your studies, give some sort of logic to how you put things together in essays? Well, I want to suggest to you a simple reflective model offered by Gary Rolfe and uh, Jasper and Freshwater, three authors back in 2011. On your course, it's likely that you will meet a number of different reflective practice modules, uh, re reflective, reflective practice models, sorry. And uh, I'm not denigrating the others, but I think from the point of view of a practical replicable over many different module um, practices, a very simple one that asks three questions over and over and over again, a useful one. What, so what, and what next? Which is really what Rolf and his colleagues proposed. Next slide. So what? Pain is contextual, circumstantial, individual. It's really constant. So that that's, comes under what? The theory of pain. Pain is modulated by varying levels of coping. This is affected by volume and type of support. That's the theory of coping. We can write about that under what? Chronic pain management by opiates does not automatically result in addiction, but other side effects require attention. That comes from research. Patients inject meanings into pain and distress given a purpose, often symbolic. Um, so, for example, if you asked in body image terms, uh, what's the most important part of your body if you were to have something um, damaged and painful and distressing? What's your most important asset to your body? It's your face. That has more weight in terms of the psychology of coping with disability and disfigurement than anything else. And after that, it becomes things like hands because of the utility value of your hands. So patient inject meanings into pain and distress. It's given a purpose, often symbolic. So we need to understand that. Patient's notion of dignity and what counts as dignified care are strongly associated with the freedom to manage the pain in their way. That's simply what I've learned over um four or five decades of practice in healthcare, both in the psychological areas and the physical areas. So that's still things which we could record in our notes under what? Next slide. So then the second question proposed by Rolf et al is then, well, so what? Well, we need to establish patients' preferred ways of coping and their current resource of support. If we don't do that, if we simply give them some more analgesia, we may have attacked the symptom, but we may have started to acknowledge the sign, but we haven't thought at all about living. We haven't really helped the patient. So suddenly we're now building notes, aren't we, from across all those modules, all those different ologies, all those different lectures and experiences you had that start to cling together to enable you to feel, I'm going someplace with this. We need to find ways to monitor and record changes in pain and distress. That's understand and need. And we need to examine changing goals and context of the patient. What is pain management meant to achieve? So these are the sort of things we could put under the head in, in our notes. So what? Next slide. What next? Well, classically, what next is all about what you then did. If you were doing a reflective practice essay on a clinical area, on a case study patient or an episode, then you might record what you and the patient did next to try and define or solve a problem. But it can be a bit more than that. We clarify the pain's pain, pain distress management agenda, what do they want to do. We illustrate ethically what has seemed helpful to others. You very rarely hear that talked about on nursing courses, but really great nurses 
do learn from other patients and what's worked for them and without naming the other patient or um, breaking their confidentiality, you take the essence of that and say, well, you might try this. This worked in this sort of context and see what you think. That's not from a textbook. It's not from research. It's not from um, an audit. It's not from statistics. We determine best means of monitoring and reviewing the shared pain, and we brief others so that they can collaborate successfully. That is what nurses spend their time doing in the practice template of pain distress. And the fact is, you do it again and again and again and again with lots of different patients. And if you've got the essence of that, if you've got that sorted out in your mind, you can add to it research, you can add to it um, other forms of evidence and, and building experience, but you've got something you bring to the encounter with the patient. You actually have something that you offer at the opening of the encounter. Next slide. So let's summarize and look, I'm re really well behaved. I'm almost up to the 10 to um, three um, deadline and I am on the last slide, aren't you impressed? So let's summarize. Learning is abstract, confusing, and multifaceted. multifaceted. It overloads possible. Do you agree with me? Or do you think that I'm just trying to push a case? I suggest to you that that is probably what learning has sometimes seemed like to you. You'll tell me later on, perhaps, whether I'm right. We need to order information and evidence from different places. To take Ray Metz's example, being flung backwards and forth into the sea and then dragged back out again, if the two never meet, if we can't work out what on earth we've learned from experience in the clinical area and how that ties up with theory, we'll never become confident practitioners. We'll never feel that we've got some sort of agency, some sort of power to contribute to care that makes us feel good about ourselves at the end of the day. If you look at this little illustration, which I've used, is from a trip I had to Venice uh, before they banned the cruise ships. You'll notice that the person in the near gondola is looking back over their shoulder. Lots of things steer us on the course of the journey we follow, but sometimes it's worth looking back over our shoulders and looking ahead and trying to make sense of where we're being carried. And it's that sense of direction, that sense of feeling that you have some sort of insight that enables you to meet another patient to sustain your practice over decades, literally decades, because that's what the, um, the society is going to need of nurses if we're going to be successful. We just need to discover what is most important and usable, deployable, utility. Theory alone can be important. It may be about explaining the ethos of nursing, but by itself, we have to come back to utility. What can we practically do that would enable us to help people and to feel decent about our contribution? We can do, build templates across modules and placements using what, so what, and what next. We can use those headings if you want in your portfolio. I'm not decrying or denigrating the other reflective frameworks which your course may require of you. But if there's any negotiating room, I do commend this simple three question approach it does give you lots of flexibility to deal with lots of situations. Pursuing templates help us to analyze, speculate and combine learning. We know where we're going. So that's really what this has been about. It's been, if you like, an overview of the whole of your learning. I suspect you're going to have lots of questions. There'll be discrete questions about practical things within learning, about essay writing and about um, making inquiries, learning in practice, using the library, whatever. All those things are important. And I'm delighted to, to assist you with those. But seeing the overview, I suggest, seeing what template thinking can do, the subject matter of the sixth edition of critical thinking, writing and nursing, might actually give you a sense of direction, might give you a sense of confidence, might you help you write the better essays, because you can say, this is why I want to talk about experience here, why I want to use theory there, why I want to commend this research evidence. It helps you to bring the lot together. Next slide. So 
Key references, Rolf Jasper and Freshwater Critical Thinking and Reflection Practice, 2011, a simple um, reflective framework, which I think can go beyond simply reflecting on practice episodes. My new book, Critical Thinking and Writing Nurse and Sixth Edition is imminently out. Um, I do make reference in the fifth edition to um, template thinking, but I press it further in the sixth edition. I think it's important because if you're going to manage the sheer volume of information and all the different writing techniques and um, collaborating techniques required in a nursing course, then I think having some sort of sense of how it could all hang together will be liberating. A study skills book, a study skills lecture isn't going to perhaps entirely deal, deal with that. And the companion volume, which connects up in case study illustration in many ways, Deliver in person centered care and nursing, second edition, London, from our good folk at Sage Publishing. I think that's enough now. You've listened very patiently to me, and uh, I hope it's seemed relevant to you. Uh, you may have a number of questions, some more discreet. Um, I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you so much, Bob. That was, uh, that was amazing. Sorry, I was trying to unshare my screen before I started talking again. But uh, yeah, that, that was brilliant. And as someone who has nothing to do with nursing, I was still quite intrigued by some of the things that you need to think about. Um, I think there are some questions in here. Um, and we also have quite a few pre submitted questions. So I will actually start off with one of those. Um, <clears throat> and so it's actually... Um, Quite, quite an interesting question. I think it's quite uh, focused as well. So when referencing with a dissertation, uh, can you use systematic literature reviews as evidence or are you only meant to reference primary research? Okay, uh, that's a, a great example of a discrete but a very important question. I think with um, this, this matter, uh, it's to do with the level of your course. Let's imagine you're on a pre-registration course, uh, becoming a qualified nurse. I think there should be no problems, although there may be directions from your course handbook to stop you referencing and referring to um, systematic reviews uh, being published and uh, presented by others. I think what's important, though, is that you have to check how they did the systematic review, because that's important. In a sense, it's secondary information, isn't it, that you're using? It's not the primary research. But providing a la Cochrane, Cochrane database, the techniques of the systematic review have been methodical and clear and exemplary, then I don't see why that shouldn't be a part of the evidence that you present in your dissertation. I think once you get to the higher levels, to master's degree and to PhD, it may be the case that you need to do more of the legwork yourself and you should be uh, trying to um, study the original papers um, completed by the researchers. So it's about level. In my view, taking stock is a good exercise anyway, and acknowledging who somebody else who's taken stock is 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 a good thing to do. Uh, so by and large, I would say yes, but do check your course handbook. Brilliant. Um, for another one, and this is interesting, I've never heard of this, but is it suitable, or are these templates suitable for uh, joining nursery audits? In this case, persons doing financial nursery? Not. Um... I'm not sure of the context that you're describing, but um, I think templates in principle could work in any area. Um, you could, uh, most practice professions are going to work on the basis of some sort of practice template. Uh, you've got a practice template, my susp suspicion is, for running webinars and for coordinating information so that people feel uh, that it's accessible and exciting and that they can trust you. You've got a smiley face, of course, <laughs> But beyond that, you'll have some working te tenets and principles as to how you run it. So nearly everybody has practice tenets. The first time you meet a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a new partner, whatever sexuality one is, uh, you've got templates in your head about how you make that first encounter. We can't escape them. So we have to use them. And I think we have to understand how we're using them. That could be true of a nursery course. It could be of an admin course. It could be a finance course. Uh, I think we just have to acknowledge that they're there and see if we can put them to better purpose. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, the next question is, how do you see practice templates being used within curriculum planning for pre-reg programs? Right. Care here, because I've 
deduced a number of things. I told you the story of altered body image work with Simon Weston and others in Burns units. And I told you about my feelings about the plethora of care standards set, understanded by, by the NMC, and um, Raymond's frustration of trying to deal with lots of different learning situations. Um, so I, I just think we need now to make sense of things. I think if you think, uh, I'll give you another analogy. Some of you might be old enough. You might be my age, heaven forbid. You may remember the Bruce Lee films uh, uh, for the Kung Fu movies. And famously, in that stereotype, um, Bruce Lee, who gets called Grasshopper. You wouldn't be allowed to call anybody Grasshopper, by the way, now. <laughs> but Grasshopper goes to the master and he says to the master, Master, what is knowledge? And in the mimics, when they mimic this, they always put it in this sort of esoteric language. What is knowledge? <laughs> and the master says to the poor uh, uh, Bruce Lee, as he's learning not, uh, the philosophy of Kung Fu as well as the techniques, he said, knowledge, grasshopper, knowledge is the sound of one hand clapping. <laughs> now, the, the problem is, the problem is, healthcare can't be like that, can it? We can't actually... Uh, go on a trip where it's everything to everybody and nobody wants to pin it down and demics don't want to help you to think how about how you can pull it together so i think we have to have templates i don't think we can deliver endlessly inquisitive endlessly non-pin downable information to people because it simply becomes more and more onerous and becomes problematic now that's my view it's not the view necessarily of all academics it's certainly true that nursing has developed as a profession from its history of simply delivering medical care. But to do that, um, we have to think about how far it goes and how we collate it and how we can bring it together. So that's a that's a personal opinion. It's not something that's necessarily advocated across the profession. Great. Um, we've got one more that's a bit more specific, which is, um, can the templates be used in IAS assignments for nursing level three? Um, I think you have to start from the premise of what the, how the question set out. How is it framed? Um, there are um, examples where people have done um, skill workshops and where they come to different uh, settings and have to be encounter with a problem and then have to solve the problem and then they have to combine the skills together so they give authentic response. Um, I think it could be that templates are a very, very good way to draw together why you think as you do or why you take the action that you do. The problem with it is, is that if we're ahead of uh, the assessment parameters of how the assessment has been set up, then you could shock the examiners. You could say, oh, goodness, why, why not think like this? And you could, therefore, um, completely dislodge them. So I think check what the assessment parameters are. Check what the assessment criteria are. If you can, before any form of assessment, speak to the module tutor and say, I'd like to use this approach. Is that acceptable? It's not cheating to try and find out what is an acceptable way to approach this uh, from an academic and um, on that note, actually, we had an interesting pre-submitted question from an academic, which was, um, do you have any um, ideas or tips on what lecturers can do to motivate their students in enhancing critical thinking skills rather than fearing it? Okay. Um, well, I used to think, to some extent still do, the great teachers are frustrated actors. Um, I have the sneaking suspicion that a really good teacher entertains as well as informs. Um, I'll give you one example of how this can be done. I was given a lecture at a conference in Vienna, and I had to try and explain body image to 2,000 cancer nurses seated before me in the lecture hall. And the chairman on the board, on, on the on the um, platform, he said, well, and now we have Bob Price who's going to talk to you about body image. And everybody else had done pre-prepared notes and simply read their paper. I didn't. I said, I want you to, to start with a little exercise. What I want you to do just for one minute and promise me you can trust me because I'm a nurse. I want you to stare at your next door neighbour. I want you to stare in their face intently 
for one minute and then I'm going to ask you some questions. Now, <laughs> you're not supposed to do that in a conference lecture, are you? So you've got to try, I think, and help people to rethink how they frame the nature of learning and reframe the nature of knowledge. What I then did was after a minute, I asked them to close their eyes and then I asked them some questions. I said, did you notice what color their eyes were? And hands went up. And because their eyes were closed, only I knew how many hands were up. So I was still in control, come in plan, wasn't it? And I said, oh, goodness, 70% of you actually uh, knew what color the eyes of the person next to you was. OK, let's call question two. Did they have any hairs growing out of their nose? <laughs> And you've guessed it, only about 20% of them thought they knew whether the person had hairs growing out of their nose. Remember, this is altered body image. And then we got to question three. Were their teeth beautifully aligned or a little crooked? <laughs> it was even less. Now, the point I'm giving you is that I then was able to say, right, OK, now you've understood why body inch is so important, because you were so worried about your own physical appearance. And now you look to your neighbor, you didn't notice what they looked like. So I think a great lecture, a good lecture, a decent lecture, um, will often reframe experience. They'll reframe knowledge. But I think they also, if they're honest, they should acknowledge that knowledge is incomplete. It's fragmented. And instead of pretending and filling in, they should encourage people to say, well, we could speculate, couldn't we? What about this? That makes sense? Brilliant. Yeah, that was actually very interesting. It, uh, <laughs> it, it gives you a lot to think about, doesn't it? Um, mm. I think we have come to the end of the questions, unless, you know, there's anyone else hyping a last minute question in here. But um, if not, and looking at how the chat is uh, kind of overwhelmingly positive, Bob, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you on behalf of all the attendees, uh, because it seems like everyone seems to have found this very interesting, very helpful, and all the comments say so as well. And on behalf of the Booster Skills team as well, we just like to thank you for taking the time out to actually explain what your book is about and, and give the students so many, I think, very, very helpful tips. Um, and again, as mentioned in the chat multiple times, Bob's new book will be out very soon, so you can use that link and pre-order it with a discount code. Um, if you arrive late or anything, um, we will be sending out an email with slides and a link to the video afterwards as well. So please keep an eye out on your email for that. And uh, yeah, hope to see you guys all at another event. But thank you all so much. Thank you, Bob, for everything today. And I hope you have a lovely day, everyone.